We know why you're watching. You've got a problem. A ghost problem. A ghost-related problem. Like a, a ghost. It's like a ghost-adjacent. It's like a problem that's in the ghost. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. Welcome back, peeps, etc., so on and so forth. What's up? Mm, nada. I'm not introducing myself if that's what you're <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Rojan. Well, the reason I'm, you know what? Here's the problem. Every every week we introduce ourselves at the beginning of the show, and then yeah, we right. kind of introduce ourselves at the end of the show. Maybe we should start off, I should start saying, I'm you and you're me. <laughs> I love you. You love, love me. me. Oh Jesus! <laughs> the Barney Chronicles. Oh, I can God. always jump back into Meat Wide voice. Hello, this, Bob. this is me, Rob. <laughs> Welcome to Project Archivist. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> oh, that's wow. the new opening for the show. Well, well, I got. I always have my ending. Yeah. Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. So, what's been up, man? How you been? Oh, you know, same old, same old. Gearing up for my trip out to Indiana in a couple of weeks, trying to get the house together to put on the market. You know, living the dream. My wife's been on layoff for the last couple of weeks, so we've been Ugh. trying to cram as much stuff as we can because she's she works so much. Right. We don't have time to do anything. So she did gardening this week, and she was in the backyard gardening. And I have this thing that um, I'm really, really – I think we've got poison ivy in the backyard or poison sumac. It's It's some – vicious poison plant that would love to grow into my bedroom and strangle me at night Nice. but um i told her she was guarding earlier in the week and i'm like don't touch that stuff with your bare hands i'm like don't even touch that stuff at all because if it comes near me i i react real badly to it and mm-hmm. she's like nah don't worry about it blah 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 well if you've ever touched poison ivy or like that once you get that sap on you it sticks to you and it sticks to everything you touch it gets on your clothes and it doesn't wash out real easy no, it's oil based it's called urosol Exactly. So she gets it on her, and of course, you know, I forget about it. Night come comes along, and we go to bed, and I wake up the next day, and I've got little dots all over my shoulder and all over my body from sleeping next to her, or maybe she rubbed it on the sheets. I don't know. So now I've got these little poison ivy, poison oak, poison death junk all over me, and it itches like hell. (laughs) Nice. So... This leads me into our first story of the night, which is um, I saw this and immediately I thought about the week's previous poison ivy incident. And this is giant hogweed spreading across New York State. DEC warns of burns and blindness. Now, I'm going to tell us about it in the story, but me and you were talking about it off the air. Um, I'm going to read the story, but what the giant hogweed is, it's, it's a plant and it's got a sap on it. And if the sap gets on you, it's not cool. It is very much the opposite of cool. And what it does is um, it gets rid of your, uh, what, what is it? It gets rid of your, your body's resistance to UV and ultraviolet rays yeah. wherever it touches. It essentially so, turns into like a, a magnifying glass on your skin. Yeah, so if you get this stuff on you, wherever it touches, the sap touches you, it touches your skin, and the sun hits it, it cooks your hand, it, it cooks wherever it touches like mm-hmm. a microwave when the sun hits it. Mm-hmm. So the story goes, the giant hogweed is a stunning plant reaching up to 12 feet tall with flowers as big as umbrellas, but it's also dangerous. Its sap can cause third degree burns and blindness, and New York environmental officials are worried the plant is spreading across the state at an alarming rate. The Daily News New York reports. Officials have found 944 sites in New York, according to the news, including some in Nassau County, Long Island, and Putnam County, where the green monster is flourishing. Then it gives you a little number to call, a hotline number, if you find the stuff then it says below in quotations if the sap gets on your skin and is exposed to sunlight you end up with third degree burns oozing scars Naja Kraus, the DEC's giant hogweed program coordinator told the New York Post adding if it gets in your eyes you can go blind Kraus told the Post her office has been receiving reports of kids using the plants four inch wide stems as telescopes really bad idea putting them up to their eyes and getting severe burns on their face and one dec technician who was exposed to the plant got a horrible burn on her leg that has still she still has to cover up the dc dec says giant hogweed is a native of 
I'm going to screw this up again. Caucasus. Caucasus mountain region between the Black and Caspian Seas. It was introduced to Europe and the United Kingdom in the late 19th century. In the United States in the early 20th century as an ornamental garden plant. Here's my problem with this. It was introduced in the United Kingdom and Europe in the 19th century and the United States in the 20th century. Now, they had a century to figure out that this stuff probably shouldn't be handled, shouldn't be played with, and probably isn't a good idea to import or export anywhere. Mm. So, you know, I don't under – okay, they didn't realize back then, hey, if you touch this plant, it'll burn you or something to that well, effect. Why did they bring it over? Well, you got to look at the fact that we're living in different times. If you were out working in your garden in the early, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, you were covered up more than we are now. I mean, women went to the water with freaking full body suits on, for God's sakes. So even still, you know, it's like the well, same thing with poison ivy. I'm not going to go out in my backyard and grab poison ivy and go, hey, this is great. Maybe I should export this to Canada and someone can well, plant it in their garden. See, yeah, but you, you got to also, <laughs> well, yeah, I can understand that. But you also got to look at like, I mean, look at foxglove. It's digitalis. You, a little kid or anybody even, you know, decides to touch the plant and then put their hands in their mouth. You get a, you're going to have a heart attack. Digitalis is what's used in heart medication, but it's a beautiful plant. Same thing with, you know, monk's hood. They're poisonous plants. They're for ornamental use. I mean, they're not for rubbing on your body or putting your eyes through or, you know, so, I mean. Well, the other thing is this plant looks like, what's what's the other plant this looks like? It's a real common plant you were talking about? Um, yeah. Well, what did I say it looks like? Uh, Queen Anne's Lace. Yes, yes, which is real. It's a real common plant. You see this it stuff is. growing, and yeah, you see it growing out in the in the wild all the time. Mm -hmm. So I could very easily see how someone would grab this and think, "Oh, it's this and not that." Um, I'll have a link to it up on the web page, and if you go and take a look at the picture of it, it doesn't look at all like a threatening plant. It's actually a very attractive plant, mm -hmm. and it does say it's twelve feet tall and it has flowers as big as umbrellas, and they do get pretty big. But um, I'm also going to try to find some pictures of people that have gotten burned from this stuff because it's really wicked. Yeah. Um, God, I mean, just the devious side of me wants to get this stuff and really wear really <laughs> thick gloves and like get some sap in a bottle, you know? Nice. <laughs> Put it in a squirt gun and hit your enemies with it. Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> <Like suck. laughs> yeah. Just have a little like glass veil. Someone's driving next to you and gives you a problem. You just toss it out the window at them when they're driving their car. <laughs> Think anything of it till the next day when the sun comes out. Nice. Oh, that would suck. Actually, as, as we're talking about this story, my poison ivy is literally itching right now. Of course now. it is. It's psychosomatic. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Considering that we just we just uh, finished covering something that was devious and destructive from the plant kingdom, I figured we'd uh, maybe check out something that's a little more productive from the flora slash fauna world we live in. And this one comes from the telegraph.co.uk, and it's in the science section. It's called the Elixir of Life Discovered on Easter Island. It's, uh, a drug has been discovered which scientists believe can reverse the effects of premature aging and could extend life by more than a decade. Rapamycin, which is nicknamed the forever young drug, was created by a chemical found in the soil of Easter Island, one of the most remote places on Earth and 2,000 miles off the coast of Chile. It was used in experiments on children suffering from Hodgkinson's Guilford progeria syndrome, HGPS, a rare genetic condition in which aging is hyper-accelerated and sufferers die of old age at around 12 years. HGPS causes a dangerous process wherein the protein called progerin builds up in every cell of the body, causing them to age prematurely. Repomycin cleaned the cells of progerin, which swept away the defects and left healthy cells. Now, this goes on for quite a while with uh, other, you know, there's other links and whatnot yeah. that are in here, but uh, rapamycin is already used to suppress immune systems in organ transplants. Now, this, this has been around for quite a while. I remember hearing about it um, during a um, show. I believe it was on either Science Channel or Discovery Channel. I mean, they're one and the same at some point. And uh, people started digging around in Easter Island, and they came across this stuff called rapamycin. And the, the pharmaceutical companies just went mad. They were like, oh, my God, we, something that maybe be able to use. And uh, I recall it, um, I want to say probably at least five years ago. 
I heard about it. Mm-hmm. But for it to be used on these children with HGPS is amazing. I mean, every year people are roaming around the planet looking for stuff that can help in the pharmaceutical trade. You think about it, people are always talking about how, you know, the rainforest can do this and the rainforest can do that. And people are completely against cutting this down and cutting that down. And I can understand that. But to find a place that is completely barren of its original life, to be able to have something like this in the soil is, I mean, we'll be able to find stuff all over the planet. How do you go about discovering something like this? I mean, what? It's an oops, man. What, what did somebody? I mean, I've got this vision in my head of people from from old people from Florida making the trip down to Easter Island <laughs> and eating dirt now. But you know, Here's what, mud pie. How, yeah, how do you come across? Let's dig some dirt up off the ground and see if there's something in here that keeps people from aging. How do people come across discoveries well, like this? See, what people do is they do the same thing in deep ocean, and what they'll do is they'll they'll take samples from all over the place. They'll take samples of sponges off the ocean floor. They'll take samples of just random um, soil samples from all over the place. And they bring it back to the lab and they put it through like an analyzer. I'd give you the scientific name for it, but half the time when I try to spit it out, it comes out wrong. And yeah. I don't want to look like more of an idiot than I already am. They'll just, they just start sifting through and they start looking for stuff and they'll find something out of the ordinary, uh, a fungus, a mold, you know, uh, some obscure chemical from a sponge and they'll start using it on cells and see how it reacts to cells. It's, it's a completely hit or miss thing. But at this point, if you send a guy out to Easter Island and they're going to be out there, he or she is going to be out there for a couple of months, comes back with some dirt and, oh, look at this, what it does to the human cell. The amount of money you spent for that person to trek around for as long as they did, you're going to make back 10, 20, 100 fold. Yeah. So... And then you have to actually copyright or patent the the drug that you find yep. and all of that stuff. So, yeah, I could see that. But I, can they replicate the drug, do you think? Is it possible oh, yeah, to replicate can. it? Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. So they they're not going to go to the island and, like, dig every ounce of dirt off of this no, island to no. – they can you know. grow it. What they do is, I believe rapamycin is a um, a mold spore, and they can grow it in labs, which hmm. they do, you know, like penicillin. You know, that's cool. Sure. All right, well, I'm going to move on with the next story here, and I'm going to take us over to Japan. This one's for the geek in me, actually. Everybody remembers, or I would think that they remember, Japan built this giant Gundam robot. It looked really cool. It was like three stories high or something like that. I can't remember. Um, 60 feet. 60 feet, that's correct. It's referenced in the story here. Mm-hmm. Maybe the 60-foot high uh, life-size Gundam, and it was really cool. Well, then the then the earthquake came through and the tsunamis came through. They took it down. They put it back up. The tsunami came through. They took it back down again. But what they're going to do, Japanese town plans a giant robot throwdown. I am a mecha freak. I love mecha stuff. I used to watch Robotech when I was a kid, mm-hmm. when it was on TV. I had the Voltron robots. I had all three of them, even though they only made a cartoon for two. They made the lion one, mm-hmm. and they made the one with all the vehicles. And they had another Voltron robot that was three robots that cooked together. One was mm-hmm. red, one was blue, and one was black. And they never released a cartoon for that. And um, I'm amazed that I managed to find a woman and get married in life. But anyway... <laughs> And I used to play the Battletech games. I still play the tabletop Battletech game right now, actually. And I'm just a mecha nut. I, I love mecha. And I've I've seen the horrible movie Robot Jocks. I, oh. I, you know, well, there's a new one coming out that you got to see. It's called Real Steel. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm down uh-huh. for that. I'm, I'm already, yeah. I'm, I've, I'll be waiting for that one. I'll be there on opening day. Nice. But uh, here's the story. When your country famously builds a life-size statue of an iconic giant robot, there's only one thing to do. Build a giant robot's rival and then make them fight. <laughs> Instantly, I get the image of Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Exactly. That's the first thing that popped to mind when you started, when you sent me this link. I'm like, oh, man, Rock'em Sock'em. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. When Japan built a 60-foot-tall life-size statue of the titular giant robot from the groundbreaking anime Mobile Suit Gundam, which ironically I didn't really like that show, Mm -hmm. back in 2009, everyone generally agreed that, yeah, this thing was pretty damn sweet, and the Japanese took it down, put it back up again, and finally took it down for good shortly after the devastating Sundai earthquake and tsunami in March. With the full-scale Gundam statue now gone, the town of Mibu in Togichi Pro... You say that word. I'm not going to be able to spit it out. Tichigi Prefecture. Tichigi Prefecture, sometimes known as Japan's toy town for its plastic model factories, wants to fill the nation's giant robot void with yet another statue of a mecha from the famous mobile suit Gundam anime. 
This time, though, they're paying tribute to the bad guy. A volunteer group from the Mabu locals has started raising money to build a life-size version of the iconic red MS-06 Zaku-2 piloted by Mobile Suit Gundam's chief antagonist and rival, Shar Aznabel. That's one of the reasons why I didn't like the show, because the Mm -hmm. characters are so far out there. The idea was first raised back in December at a town meeting, but plans were only formalized last month when members of the team consulted with the copyright holders at Bandai and determined that the construction would cost several billion yen, tens of millions of U.S. dollars, to complete. The group is taking donations over the Internet to get things started. There are Gundam fans all over the world, said her. Hiroshi Takayama, one of the group's founders, we want to call for a corporation to build the statue. Yeah, that's exactly how it's written, too. This is definitely, mm-hmm. it, it says, we want to call for corporation to build statue throughout the world with a Twitter and Facebook. Members will also be selling beverages, colored char red naturally, at earthquake fundraising events to help fill the coffers. If this sounds like a pie in the sky dream scenario that c- could never happen to you, Mibu actually has some precedence here. The town is already home of the Bandai Museum, which features a 1-1 scale Gundam bust, elevate one lying down on the ground, so it might be able to wrangle some support from the noted toy maker. It wouldn't, it would be, wouldn't be the only town to build its own giant robot either. The city of Kobe built a life-size version of Tensuji 28Go, a.k.a. Giganator, Giggity Giggity Giganator, <laughs> back in 2009. So, yeah, this is pretty cool. They're going to they're gonna build... Um, they're going to build these two giant robots and have them battle. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was a pretty cool geeky story. They're, we probably just put a whole bunch of people to sleep right now that are going, what? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm sure there's a few of you out there that find it just as cool as I did. Oh, come on. Real life mobile suit Gundam? Come on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would. When I first saw the original picture of the original Gundam that put up, I was like, this is cool. I want to go there and get a picture of it. I don't think it's that far-fetched of an idea. I mean, no. I'm sure you've heard about the whole the RoboCop thing up here in Detroit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Where, you know, and they got the money for that, and they're going to build a life-size RoboCop statue in downtown Detroit because sure. the fans wanted it and the people wanted it. The city said no way, but they got that money together pretty quick. My buddy sure Dave did. actually... Uh, our web designer actually put money into it to uh, help help get the statue made. So this isn't that far fetched of a no. It's 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 not. I mean, look look what we have in the, here in the states besides the RoboCop statue, which isn't here yet, but will be soon. Yeah. I mean, we have we have a giant elephant in New Jersey. We have a Paul Bunyan statue. Yep. I have pictures yep. of my wife in front of a giant moose in a giant chair. There's stuff all over. Route 66 was loaded with this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really not that far-fetched. Plus, they've already got one robot, so... Sure. Why What's not another robot? Have another, yeah, exactly. What's another robot? It's I want Japan. A, I want a... Yeah, it's Japan. Exactly. Exactly. I, I want a robot in my town. I, every, sure. every town should have its own mecha. Why not? Why not? Hi there, folks. I'm Pastor Recoil, and I'm here to share with you a message about bacon. Because I like bacon. And do you know who else likes bacon? Seder over at the-bunker.net. So if you like bacon too, check out Transmissions from the Bunker at the-bunker.net. Hey everybody, my name is TJ and I host the 13 Skulls podcast. If you've ever had an unexplainable experience, then you know it's hard to understand. Visit www.the13skulls.com and come with me on a journey to a world that lies just beyond our comprehension. The world of the paranormal. Are you troubled by irregularity? Then listen to Access Denied Humans Defective. Nine out of ten doctors say you'll shoot yourself every time. Access denied humans defective. Download it from iTunes or directly from the show website at accessdeniedradio.com. All right, so considering that you just finished doing your Gundam suit, and uh, I'm always pumping for a better Connecticut, I uh, sent this story over to you, we looked over it, and you decided that I should read it because out of the two of us, between stumbling, I'd the, probably do it. The glow the glow the glow I think you just proved my point. Liggity, the gl- <laughs> the Glowacus of Glastonbury. The story goes, 
1939, a, mis- a mystery creature terrorized Glastonbury and surrounding areas, attacking livestock and pets. It was never caught and properly identified, and consequently became a Connecticut legend, the Gloacus. Hunters and farmers and eyewitnesses reported the fierce animal originally as a huge cat, but as it remained elusive, the description became more detailed, which only embellished the creature's fast-growing reputation. It was variously described as part dog, part bear, and part cat, but all terror. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Um, It's a lengthy article, so I'm going to skip around a little bit. Uh, And I'm going to leave the cat, the, the clincher for the best part at the end. So I'm going to move right on to the entomology from town named Glastonbury, Connecticut, plus Wacky. That's where the name Glowacky comes from. Uh, it was the, also known as the Granby Panther and, please forgive me, my Native American sister. And it was also called the Injun Devil. <laughs> uh, the physical description looks varies variously like a large cat or dog, length four feet high, two feet Two feet, six inches long, black or tawny in color, long tail, sometimes described as bushy, emits a blood-curdling scream, tracks like a puma, and it was uh, distributed throughout north-central Connecticut. Now, I'm in Wallingford, and we're in the center of Connecticut. Glastonbury is about a 20-minute drive from here. Mm -hmm. So it had uh, mysterious behavior. It was first seen in January of uh, 1939, and there's been stories – on and off throughout the years about this animal. Now, the wonderful thing about this is you got to realize that in 1939, they, they, they set out a hunt. They were going to go and get this animal. And, uh, you know, there's an artist rendition of it on, a, on the page. And then it goes down into what it probably really was. Um, no one has ever come up with a definitive answer to the Gloacus identity, but many have speculated that it was either a rogue eastern puma, which I will state for the record that uh, about six months ago was listed as an extinct animal in Connecticut, and then about two weeks ago, one was hit on the turnpike. <laughs> now it's extinct. At, well, this is the thing. Now there's more of them being spotted. So thank you. I don't know anything about extinct animals. Now back to the story. Or another large cat that escaped from a local exotic animal collection. Other suggestions are that it's a fisher cat, and that would explain the blood-curdling screams. Now, there's a fisher cat that lives right up the street from here. They're nasty. They will eat your cat. They will eat small dogs. And the screech that comes out of them will set your hair on end. So was it a mystery creature, or was it superstition and people just not knowing what it was? I'm going to probably go for the latter, but it makes a good story. Sounds ornery. Well, it's 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 a member of the weasel family. I mean, a big member. If you could really, there's a picture of it on the page, and the first thing that comes to mind is a wolverine. It's smaller than a wolverine, but just as voracious. What I'm seeing on the page is a picture of a guy holding a gun to what looks like a giant rabbit, <laughs> which it? immediately makes me think of Monty Python and the quest for the Holy Grail and, with the man eating a rabbit in the cage in the cave. The holy hand grenade. There he is. Where? What, behind the rabbit? It is the rabbit. You silly sod. You got us all worked up. Well, that's no ordinary rabbit. That's the most foul, cruel and bad-tempered rodent you ever set eyes on. You tit. I saw my arm and I was so scared. Look, that rabbit's got a vicious street a mile wide. It's a killer. Get Oh, it'll do you a, a treat, mate. Oh, you yeah? Manky Scots git. I'm warning you. What's he do? Nibble your bum? He's got huge, sharp... Uh, he can leap about... Look at the bones! Go on, boys. Chop his head off. Right, silly little beater. One rabbit suit coming right up. All right, this next one comes from... You know, my wife just told me last week, Mrs. Lobo said, you know, you guys say this one comes from an awful lot. So, hellfire have no cannon. This new one is from the businessinsider.com. It's the Navy bought fake Chinese microchips that could have disarmed U.S. missiles. Last year, the U.S. Navy bought 59,000 microchips to use in everything from missiles to transponders, and all of them turned out to be counterfeits from China. Wired reports the chips weren't only low-quality fakes, they had been made with a back door and could have been remotely shut down at any time. If left undiscovered, the results could have rendered useless U.S. missiles and killed the signals from aircraft 
that tells everyone whether it's friend or foe. Apparently, foreign chip makers are often better at making cheap microchips, and U.S. defense contractors are loath to pass up a better deal. The problem remains that these Trojan horse circuits can be built into chip and are also impossible to detect, especially without the original plans to compare them to. The Intelligence Advanced Research Project Agency, IARPA, is now, is now looking for ways to check the chips to make sure they haven't been hacked in the production process. Expect to see a whole lot more funding directed to this goal, or considering a IARPA is the research and development section of the intelligence community, expect the money to be spent. Don't expect to see where. Nice. That's the story. So Trojan circuits. Pretty much, that's what it is. I don't know. So how much stuff do you think? That, do you think any of this stuff's already gotten through? I would imagine some of it has. I was listening to another podcast earlier this week, and they were talking on there about how that they have found they have found keyboards that have gotten into this country with keylogger programs and mm-hmm. keyloggers already put into them. Yeah. So you can go out and buy a keyboard, hook it up to your computer, and it'll just send out it'll transmit data from the keyboard. And unless you're specifically looking for them, that you wouldn't find this stuff. No, and it wouldn't be picked up by any of your spyware stuff because it's hardware. Exactly. So they've already found these and confiscated them coming into the country. But you were about to say? Well, see, I work for a company that we do defense contracts, and they literally are lowball. They they want the lowest price possible. If you're a government contractor, what you what you aim to do is be able to get it out the door, and you try to get it out the door in mass quantity to make up make up the difference. So nice. I mean, we you you do whichever half do you do. You know, if you got to spend a little more money to be able to have something that's not going to be hacking. You know, I mean, I can understand if they're hacking like a soda machine or, you know, someone's tablet, but missiles? Really? I, mean, I can see on. it. Yeah, I can oh, see it. Why not? No, I, yeah, but I, I can't see them lowballing for allowing for something like this to happen. That's that's just that's not only like ignorant; it's negligent. You know what? Me and you were talking off the air about the audio piece that I found about how I believe it was Congress was grilling the Department of Homeland Security about this very issue. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to try to find that audio clip, and I think I'm going to try to put it into the show right after this. That'd be sweet. And it talks about – and and you hear the guy stammering. They ask him point blank, do you know anything about China sending something like this into our country or foreign manufacturers? And the guy is like, uh, I, um, well, uh, uh, er, I, could you re-ask the question, please? Right. And it is funny, but again, it's not funny. So it's, it's one of those things. Yeah, it is. It is. Thank you. I, uh, I will uh, now recognize myself for, for five minutes. Um, one of the emergency national security concerns is that you have software, infrastructure, uh, hardware, other things that are built overseas that come to the United States with um, – uh, items that are embedded already in them by the time they get here to the United States. Um, this poses obviously a security and intellectual property risks. What, A, is this happening, Mr. Schaefer, and B, uh, what are we going to do to, to fight back against this? Uh, thank you, sir. The, uh, clearly, supply chain risk management is an issue that the administration is focused on, that uh, Homeland Security working with uh, partners uh, at the table and, and how and how how are they focused on? I mean, is this happening? Uh, so, is this happening? I, whether or not um, there are specific examples of insertions uh, is something I'd rather talk about. In I know you'd room. rather not. It's, it's just a yes or no question. Is this happening or not? Um, we believe that there are is significant risk in the area of supply chain. Is it happening to your best of your knowledge? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought I, I thought I threw you a softball to no, begin no, with. Here. No, no, thank, Is this happening or not? Thank you. I, I missed the very beginning of the question in the wording that you gave me, and I, I apologize. I don't want to get this wrong. Um, c- can you rephrase for me? Are there any? Are you aware of any component software hardware coming to the United States of America that are already embedded, that have have security risks already embedded into those those components? Uh, I, I am aware that there have been instances where that has happened. Okay. So wh- what are you doing? What is Homeland Security doing about What can we do about this? Th- this is one of the most complicated and difficult challenges that we have. 
Um, the, the range of issues goes to uh, the fact that there are foreign uh, components in many U.S. manufactured devices. Yes, there are US that's components. the obvious. Keep there going. US Go components. faster. I've only got five minutes here. Yes, I, 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 there I, are I, many foreign components in our materials. A, yes, I a, got it. There is a task force that DHS and DOD co-chair uh, to look at these issues with goals to identify short-term uh, mitigation strategies and to also make sure that we have capability uh, for maintaining U.S. manufacturing capability over the long term uh, and, and are in a position to ensure that the critical infrastructure pieces have what we All right, need. Let, let me go to a second. It is terribly complicated. I understand it is difficult, but the concern is that it is happening, and it's probably happening on a more frequently frequent basis than most people recognize, that these things are embedded in devices and software, and people don't know that. And it's very difficult to detect. Let, let, let me move on. So, uh, as we all know how much of a Tesla fanboy I am, um, when you sent this over to me, I was like, yes, I have to read this. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just grateful that we can read it here so that I can share my geekitude with everybody else. And it's from uh, beforeitsnews.com, and it's uh, Nikola Tesla's Black Magic Touring Car. And it's uh, based off of a 1939 Pierce Arrow electric vehicle. Or 1930, not 1939. Uh... The fuel to power the world's machinery and vehicles for thousands of years can be derived from electromagnetic wave conductors. We have known for 80 plus years that electromagnetic coupling can be used to harness a, the freely available cosmic rays and in brackets electromagnetic radiation and power the world. A simple antenna is an electromagnetic conductor which converts harnessed radio waves in free space to electrical current. This electromagnetic conversion can power all our machinery, including our automobiles. Supported by the Pierce Aero Company and General Electric in 1931, Nikola Tesla, inventor of the AC generator, took the gasoline engine from a new Pierce Aero and replaced it with an 80-horsepower AC electric motor with no external power source. Tesla reportedly bought 12 vacuum tubes, some wires, and assorted resistors, and assembled them in a circuit box 24 inches long, 12 inches wide, and 6 inches high, with a pair of 3-inch rods sticking out. Getting into the car with the circuit box in front seat beside him, he pushed the rods in and announced, we now have power. Using no gasoline whatsoever, Tesla produced, proceeded to drive the car for a week at speeds of up to 90 miles per hour. As the AC motor can only operate on AC, alternating current that is typically supplied in a home, electricity on the single 12-volt car battery wasn't the source of power as a car battery supplies only DC, direct current electricity. So what was the source of the power that powered the AC electric motor? Electromagnetic waves, which Tesla declared as a free source of power that is everywhere present in unlimited quantities. In 1931, Pierce Aero demonstrated and proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that we didn't need any gasoline whatsoever to power our automobiles. automobiles. An electric-powered automobile possesses many advantages that noisy and pollution, polluting gasoline cars could not offer. First and foremost is the absolute silence one experiences when riding in an electrically powered vehicle. There is not even a hint of noise. One simply turns a key and steps on the accelerator. The vehicle moves instantly, no cranking from the start, no pumping of an accelerator, no spark control to advance, no exhaust pipes, no leaking gas tanks, no clogged fuel pumps or lines, zero emissions, and no tune-ups. One simply turn the ignition switch to on. Second is a sense of power. If one wants to increase speed, you simply depress the accelerator further. There is never any hesitation. Releasing the accelerator causes the vehicle to slow down immediately. You are always in complete control. Thirdly, the electric vehicles envisioned by Tesla were a lot lighter as there was no battery packs 
only a single 12 volt battery was used to power the lights no gas tank with heavy liquid gasoline or diesel no exhaust system no muffler catalytic converters or pipes and no heavy combustion engine it is not difficult to understand why these vehicles were so very popular around the turn of the century. It is not obvious why the electric car was killed 80 years ago. There was no money to be made by the oil companies nor the electric companies. Even government couldn't make money from this type of electric car. With gas-powered cars, the government could charge a tax on every gallon of gasoline or diesel. Freely available electromagnetic energy could not be metered and therefore taxed. Um, they never really say what happened to this car. As far as I can tell, Tesla came in, hooked this thing up, said, we have power. I think he drove it for a little bit, oh, but yeah, then he, he left it. and took everything with him. And that was it. It was just, you know, gone. This could be one of those urban legends. There's a link here. There's a link here. I should say, I'm sorry, man, I'm just a stammering idiot tonight. But there is a link here that takes you to another site. So if anybody goes and checks this site out when we post it, there's a link here from a person, person called Stealth Skater. And it tells more about the story. But in that version of the story, it talks about, I, I guess, when uh, when Tesla was done, he just said, okay, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm taking this little device with me, with me. And that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and electric cars are this way. I, I Where I work, I test drive a lot of vehicles. And, I, you know, I've, I've test driven electric cars and, for lack of a better word, they're like a goat cart on steroids. So, you know, mm. yeah, this, uh, I don't, I, I think this might be one of those urban legends. I don't know. I don't necessarily know though. Cause there is a lot of legends floating around about Tesla and there he's always, he was always talking about grabbing power from, from the ambient world around you. He was always talking about, um, uh, he always wanted to come up with a way of transmitting energy wirelessly into the air. So you, if at home you're watching TV, you could just put something on top of your television and set it and pull energy out of the air. So this is up there with one of those stories. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, uh, well, it, along those lines, uh, he did set up he did set up small uh, stations to prove his concept and uh, was able to light light bulbs over a mile away from this quote unquote free energy source with his Tesla coils. Yeah. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. It was proven to be done. Now, if you look back in the thirties, there were electric cars, they were DC. You got to realize that Edison had a lot to do with the DC market and at the time was on a smear campaign. So, and to this day, the cars that are used that are electric cars are DC powered. DC has a firm foothold in the auto industry. Your lights, your radio, everything in the car runs off of DC power. There's no alternating current. So do I think it's far-fetched? No, not really, considering what Tesla was able to do with proof of concept. Do I think this Pierce Arrow was actually driven around like they say it was? Don't know. It wasn't there. Would I like to believe it? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know? absolutely. But, I would like to believe it. I mean, he was he was with... Pierce Arrow and General Electric. If Pierce Arrow and General Electric gave him a car and said, have at it, and he was able to do proof of concept, I believe the car was real. I'd like to see it. But then again, too. you know, who wouldn't like to see it? So, oh, yeah. You know. I mean, I've seen all kinds of cars. I've seen cars that run on paraffin wax, for God's sakes. So. Well, it's not really that far-fetched. I was reading another article earlier today when I was looking for stories for the show. And I didn't. I found a story, but I didn't use it for the show because it was just too long. Mm -hmm. But there were researchers that found a way to print out receivers that are able to pick up small amounts of energy used from cell, cell phone towers and radio towers and things mm -hmm. like that. And they were able to recharge batteries from sure. energy they were pulling in from the air and they also printed these antennas from inkjet printers of some kind mm -hmm. so it might not be that far-fetched when you consider that yeah there is energy floating all around above us because when they when these radio towers or radio stations for a great example they transmit radio waves into the air which is how you get your music and your radio in your car mm -hmm. so that energy that you're picking up that's energy being transmitted in the air that's why they have when radio stations say broadcasting to you with seventy five thousand watts of power well, the energy is just converted into radio signals, and those radio signals go out, and then your car picks them up. There is energy out there. You know, it's just a matter of how to conf how to harness it and put it back right. down again. Well, think about it. I mean, just for just ha ha sakes, this was in 1931. Okay. Yes. Think about the amount of ambient, quote unquote, electricity that was roaming in the air then, and think about what a microwave oven we are living in now. Oh yeah. 
If you live underneath power lines, you're cooked. Oh, forget about it. Well, what about that? I mean, you see people standing on their power lines holding up fluorescent bulbs all the time, lighting up, yep. lighting up light bulbs. So right there yep. is an example of, of the actual energy in effect right there. I should find videos of that and put them up on the web page just for this story to sure. demonstrate how it would happen. If I can go on YouTube, if I can find somebody find somebody holding up these light bulbs, I'm sure people have seen it. If you're not, I will make every effort that I can find to find one of these videos and put it up on the web page. There's, so it's nuts. See, yeah. I mean, there's there's even farmers that have had livestock in fields, and then a ground will go bad on one of those towers, and it cooks their animals. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is, that's just, that's, that's ambient electricity right there. I mean, I'm yeah. not talking, that's not stuff that's just floating in the air. That's to ground. There's, there's places that actually use, I was watching one of the, uh, who was it? Um, Wasn't that how the concept of harp works too? Mm, here we go with harp. Well, we don't have to go deeply into it, but basically but yeah, they're blasting yeah. the ionosphere with yep. electricity. Yep. You know, putting ambient energy up into the atmosphere. That's the theory of how HARP works, whether or not what it does is subject for another show, but that's how HARP works. Yeah, HARP was absolutely. one of Tesla's ideas. Sure. So you're talking about transmitting energy wirelessly up into the atmosphere and then grabbing the energy and putting it back into a usable source. Yeah. I mean, so it's there. There's it is, the, proof that it's there. The concept to it is solid for what mm-hmm. Tesla was talking about. This is stuff that Tesla was, in fact, working on. So this story, you know, it could have some significance, or at least the grounding in the story is makes viable sense. Whether or not Tesla pulled it off at the time, who knows, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's fun to believe in, though. Well, I mean, you consider what was done to all his files and everything by our own government. Yeah, Why that's wouldn't they make a car like this disappear, you know? That's definitely a topic for another show. Absolutely. Me and you run across stories all the time that are just ridiculous and just ridiculous. How about whack the freak out? Yeah. Um, (laughs) And I didn't originally want to use this kind of stuff on the show because we're trying to keep, you know, we're trying to educate people and we're trying to show really cool stuff that's out there. But man, I just can't ignore this stuff anymore. We're both a couple of knuckleheads. Yeah. So we're going to do a section of the show probably from now on whenever we do this type of a show. Because if you can tell by now, we've got a couple of different formats we go under. So when we do this type of a show, we're going to do a section called For the Lulls. And we have a couple of them tonight. I'll start off with mine. As I read this story, a few of you may have heard it by now. But as as I read this story, I would like for you to try to envision this in your head uh, as you see it happening. And this one is called, <laughs> I can't talk about it because I can no. envision it. And oh I have the God. banana costume. Oh, my okay. God. All right. <clears throat> the serious time now. Dan, um, Mr. Brokov. <clears throat> oh, Ohio shops, gorilla mascot attacked by banana Strongsville, Ohio. The manager of a cell phone store in Ohio called nine one one nine one one to report that a gorilla had been attacked by a banana. The wireless center in Strongsville near Cleveland advertises at curbside. This is in Cleveland. So you know who that's by in Cleveland advertises at curbside with a man in a gorilla suit. Manager Brandon Parham says he was watching last week as a kid dressed as a banana emerged from some bushes and took a flying leap at the storm mascot. Parham says the attacker looked like a Spartan from the movie 300, except he was a banana. The gorilla was knocked, knocked down, but got back up, adjusted his head and went back to work. WJW TV reports that the banana split running down the street with other teens. Police think it was a prank. They weren't able to find the offending fruit. So now I have a vision of fruit of the loon, just attacking people. The banana Espar- split. <laughs> the banana split. I just got this it. is fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your for the lull story of the oh, week? Oh mine mine comes from crazy news. And um if I think anybody is, is better. Oh, if anybody is a diehard animal lover, turn it off now, fast forward it now. You know it's not funny, but it's it not, is. but it's it's funny. It's it's like in a cosmic sort of way it's funny because when you hear where it's from, 
things will start to click and you'll be like, yes. That makes perfect That makes sense. And this is Chinese Zoo Stops Allowing Visitors to Shoot Animals. A Chinese zoo has agreed to suspend its policy of allowing visitors to shoot some of its animals. The zoo in Dangdong rented out rifles and allowed people in special areas where they could shoot the animals. It was seen as a unique unique attraction to bring in more visitors, but led to numerous complaints from animal lovers. Zoo staff defended themselves, saying visitors were only allowed to kill unprotected species. But they have now agreed to stop letting visitors shoot animals altogether, reports the South China Morning Post, quoting Laoshin Evening News. Isn't that really counterproductive of a zoo? Doesn't oh that God. go completely against what a zoo would be? This yeah. is like the cracked out Steve Irwin <laughs> type of zoo. What we are going to do is allow people to shoot our animals, to allow people to understand how endangered they really are. <laughs> God. Oh, my God. I mean, really? A, a lot, really? That's like... No, I know. I'm not, I'm not even going to go there. Where do you even, even go? What I'm do not you... even, oh, my God. Hello. Hi. I'm from the pedophile camp, and this is our lovely playground. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? Really? Wow. It's, it's uh, it's it's mind boggling. I mean, I can understand. Like I said, when I first started reading it, it makes sense now. You hear about all kinds of strange stuff, but really, <laughs> hi, this is the zoo. Here's your twenty-two. I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Wow, so we're at the end of the show, and it's 3.01 in the morning. <laughs> we should think we'd be used to this by now, but we're not. Nope. So We send out the call to have people send email, and mm-hmm. somebody did send an email, and that would be Mr. Damon Reaper, but uh, I'll read it off here. This is your friendly Damon Reaper, the guy who does the funny drawings over at Transmissions from the Bunker, writing in and doing so an email just to spite Facebook and wanted to let you guys know that I listened to episode four and I must say that I love that interview. It was refreshing to hear someone talk while not trying to shove their ideas down your throat as a lover of philosophy. I really wish I could have heard the other, the other heard, the other heard the other part of the interview. Let's read that phonetically as a lover of philosophy. I really wish I could have heard the other, heard the other part of the interview. I think he, he skipped his he skipped there the CD. Nice. It sounded like I would have been really it sounded like it would have really been interesting. I skipped the CD there. Well, since you <laughs> have the 500 page emails, I usually send in a pastor and seder and leave you with that. I love your show and I hope it sticks around for a while. Happy podcasting. Yes, Damon, we know who you are. We love your cartoons. Absolutely. Um, yeah, they're hysterical. The best one that I can recall that you did for the transmission guys were the one where uh, Pastor woke up next to Seder in bed and Seder was like, <laughs> "Hi there." <laughs> that nice. was hysterical. And by all means, if you would like to do a cartoon for us for our full all section, that would be great. And I would try to figure out a way to post them up on the page for you. But thank you very much for uh, sending in the email. He does have on the bottom. P.S. It is me, or does Lobo sound like a less sarcastic Calypso waxed? Oh man, don't um, do that. Oh, <laughs> he's Mexican. I'm Puerto Rican. There's a big difference. Why you got to be racist about your racism? Because <laughs> we're both Latinos and we're both morons. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for uh, for writing in, Damon. It's really cool. We're glad to get an email. It's uh, it's nice to see something other than a Facebook thing. Absolutely. And we've gotten a lot of feedback about the interview. Apparently, you folks like the interviews, so. That's that's cool. We can do that. We can handle that. We've got that covered. We've got that covered real quick, actually. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, um, 
yeah, you know, we're, we don't we don't plan on going anywhere. We might slow down the amount of content that we put out as our work schedules change and things come up. But we've right now we've got so many. As I keep saying, we've got so many irons in the fire. Just today, we picked up another interview confirmation. Right. The next couple of weeks, and I've got stuff out there right now waiting on other stuff. Um, I said this earlier in the show, but I edited it out that we're going to be working on something for the Tesla thing. Mm-hmm. Um, don't entirely know how that's going to work out just yet, so I'm not really putting anything out there. But we're not going to really do a roundtable discussion. We're going to be doing an interview form on it to actually give people some information. But it'll uh, be magical. Very magical. It'll be it'll be an upper body. Out, I'm sorry, out of body experience. An upper body experience. <laughs> it's late. It's very late. Um, this is the part of the show where, well, you go ahead and do your begging, Lobo. Well. In usual fashion, I'm going to request that people go out on iTunes and give us a review. I'm also going to request that people continue to send in emails like uh, Demon Raper did. Demon Raper. I just called him Demon Raper. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sure he hears that a whole I'm lot. I'm sure he does. I think I've called him that before. But, uh, yeah, send, you know, go to our uh, www.projectarchivist.com uh, and look at our page and we're getting ready to have some stuff done to the page to make it look a lot nicer, too. I've got some artwork that's about to go up there, so it's going to be less drab. It's a little bit sweet. Cooler. It's going to give it a little bit more style to it. Um, we're also on Stitcher now, so I know a lot of people that are like, they're anti-iTunes, and that's cool. I can roll with that. I can understand that. Go out, If you have a smartphone, if you have a BlackBerry, a Windows phone, if you have an iPhone, if you have an Android phone, go download the Stitcher app. It's free. If you want to listen to our show, you can just log into Stitcher, do a search for a Project Archivist. Boom, we're there. You can listen to the show. And what it does is it puts it, it transmits the, I almost said transmits it wirelessly like Tesla, but what it nice. does is it streams the show to your phone. You can listen to it anywhere. You don't have to worry about eating up any of your memory. You don't have to worry about it eating up any of your hard drive space if you're out somewhere and you want to hear it if you're sitting at the department of motor vehicles or secretary of state and you want to listen to it just go on and pop it down on your phone and listen to it there um it's actually you know it's really cool if you listen to it there because we're, we can track how many people are listening to the show if how long you're listening to it for all that fun stuff but it gives us a better idea of who is listening to it from where and uh, i listen i've got stitcher on my phone you know i listen to a lot of shows on there um, one of the other things I want to, I just, as I'm talking here, I just got a message through on Facebook. There's a guy that we use, we put music in the show and his name is, I believe is, I'm, if he hears this, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. I believe his name is Jarko Heatonen and he's got a, he's got a, um, a compilation of music out called data cube. And I friended the guy and we, I really like what he does. He's actually from your part of the state. He's from uh, Connecticut and uh, shoot, I can't remember what part, Fairfield? Fairfield. Fairfield. Yeah. Fairfield. yeah. So I wanted to send a thanks out to him for letting us use the music that he composes in our show. It's kind of, um, I can't really call it dubstep, but he does a lot of us. He does he does a lot of soundtrack music. He does a lot of soundtrack music for video games. Um, he's working on something for Splinter Cell Extinction, I believe, right now. Sweet. But he's got some cool stuff, and I'm, I'm glad that he's letting us use his stuff, and I wanted to send a thanks out to him. But um, anything else you wanted to say? Yeah, we got our email. It's projectarchivist at gmail.com. And we have our telephone number, which we're still waiting for. What is it? Heavy breathing? I haven't choking, got nothing. Heimlich maneuver? I haven't got anything. It's 734-681-0459. Give us a holler. Give us a holler. Give us a holler. Absolutely. Drop us uh, a line on Facebook. Friend us if you see us on Facebook. Absolutely. If you'd like to get into the fan page, shoot us a message and we'll put you into the fan page because lots of people post lots of stuff up there. I post stuff up there. Lobo posts stuff up there. We have a lot of fans that post stuff up there. We have a gentleman, Miles, who's a fan of the show. He posts a lot of stuff up there. So if you like what you hear on the show, go check out Hang on the the Facebook page. We don't use forums because they're just too much of a pain to run. So we use our Facebook page. We're both on Facebook pretty much all of the time, so we're very easily accessible to get in touch with us. Right. But I think that's pretty much the show for the week. I know as soon as I'm done recording, I'm going to wish I'd remembered it to say this, this, and that. Sure. Do you have any uh, web pages you want to send a shout out to this week or anything? Mm, no. No? Nothing? I don't either. I don't think so. I mean, other than you know the normal ones that we listen to. If you get a chance to, and I'm gonna th- I'm gonna throw this out here because I just I've been overdosing on it. I told you I was overdosing it on the before we started recording. Um, t- 
Tim Banal from Banal of America and uh, Jeremy Vaney have a show, and it's, uh, it's called the, uh, the the Good Parade. It's freaking hilarious. I lost my junk listening to it. I was cracking up. You know what? You just reminded me of something. I What's promised that? Mr. Jeremy Vaney I would refer to him as America's sweetheart. So, <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Vaney, you are, in fact, America's sweetheart. I'll let the cat out of the bag a little bit on this one. We're actually going to have Jeremy Vaney on the show here in a couple I of weeks. I can't wait. I love that guy. He's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to him, too. He's got a lot of knowledge of exopolitics, and the reason we're going to have him on the show is to try to educate people of not the way to get into um, you uf- ufology and things like that. Um, he's 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 had a couple of shows. He's had the Book of Thought. He's had um, Co- Co- Culture of Contact was another one. He's co-host of Paratopia. I believe he's co-host of Black- the Black Fridays. He's written numerous books. He's just got another book out. The guy is a, just a non-stop juggernaut of of producing stuff. He's always he's a creative output. He's always putting stuff out there. And we're going to have him on the show. I'm really not entirely sure what we're going to talk to him about. I think it's going to be one of those free flow jam session interviews where we just throw him out there and say, "All right, let's let's chit chat." I think we're going to talk about the top three things that uh, that annoy us or annoy him about. Uh, ufo politics if you will Mm. um and i was surprised he said yeah i can do top three that's not a problem i I was expecting to hear him say what only three i've got 94 things (laughs) oh yeah i know dude he he, get him started he'll keep going but that's fine i would i want to get that's i would like to get people on here to educate him because like to be honest with you he was one of the people that i listened to i don't agree with everything that he says but i have a tremendous amount of respect for him because he knows a lot Mm -hmm. and most of what he says a very vast majority of he's right when he talks about um when you go to a ufo conference or one of these things i went to one several years ago and i saw people walking around in klingon costumes and it just you know and when you go to these shows you've got the people that are like no this is extraterrestrial no this is this and over here you got people the space aliens are our buddies and you get other people well we don't know if this is space aliens this might be something from you know here or something from there right and he actually brought that up at one of the ones he went to and the response he got was why are you here Yes, and somebody was slamming their fist down into the table saying, we'll let him tell that story because it's a great story. And it's a great example of if you're going to get into this stuff, it's a buyer beware kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. that's what I'm hoping to get him on the show to talk about um, just so he can talk about his experiences and about why he believes what he does. And maybe he can, you know, give somebody some insight of what, because there are a lot of charlatans out there. And there's a lot of people that we're not going to have on this show. I'm not... I'm not going to go into who they are. We're not going to talk about it. But by all means, if somebody else wants to come on here and tell their story, you know what? Go ahead and have at it. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's coming down the road here. Uh, we've got another big interview that we're going to save until it actually comes up. And that person's on our bucket list, and I'm very much looking forward to talking to that person. So are you. Yeah, absolutely. And that should be next episode. And it's going to be, uh, hopefully, it'll it'll be it'll be one of our finest hours because we're really, really looking forward to talking to this person. Absolutely. I've been waiting. <laughs> yeah, we were waiting to talk to this person before we even had the concept of doing this show. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Well, you were doing Anomalous still. Yep, yep, exactly. Because that was originally supposed to be an anomalous piece, and that actually, the conversation that led up to that person getting onto this show is what led to the idea for this show. Right. How many times can I say this show? I don't know. Want to go over one more time? No, I think I'm pretty much done saying this show. Oh, very good. And on that note, we should bring this show to an end. So This show. This show. Not that show. This show. Okay, Eventually, good. we'll bring that show to an end like we are with this show. How many times nice. is that now? Seven? Eight? I don't know. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is Rojan. Peace out from the D. And this is Lobo for a better Connecticut. For a better Connecticut? I thought it was to a better Connecticut. <laughs> well, at this point, whatever. I think by nature of being, you are just making Connecticut a better state. I am indeed <laughs> doing my <laughs> fill to make this a better place. Peace out, people. Peace.
freely available electromagnetic ma- yeah. god i'm gonna have to reread this whole damn part hold on <laughs> it is now obvious why electric car was killed 80 years it was <laughs> do it the glow the glow Ex- glow 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 i think you just proved my point liggity, gl- liggity, gl- gl- <laughs> gl- giddy, giddy. english motherfucker, do you speak it part of their science section <laughs> you're gonna want to redo that whole piece oh my god do you know what you did no oh, what did i do you went you called it the telecraft the telecraft oh, oh tara you said telecraft oh no don't do that we can't we can't start going chinese now no i don't think so that would that is a in the category of easter egg if it were something <laughs> if it were talking about like you becoming a thai lady boy or something like that, that oh man story. here we go with the thai lady boy again <laughs>